So welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Fisher. I've been a professional photographer since 1978. So this is my 40th year. So that's why there's the big band here blaring and all the balloons and the clowns and okay, there's no big celebration, but this, this is my celebration. So it's the way I celebrate is, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I worked in newspapers forever and then I uh, did freelance work and, and, and now I mainly shoot nature-based fine art photography. And I do also uh, pet photos, dog photos. Uh, uh, my sister-in-law has a dog store here in, in Somerville. So I, I do some of that too and, and whatever comes along. But I'm, I mainly do the fine art, uh, nature-based photography that I sell at, work sh at uh, art shows up and down the East Coast. And uh, I also do a lot of, a lot of workshops. And that's a lot of fun. And, and uh, you know, the interesting thing is uh, I've always hung around photographers. I mean, always, you know, from college through, through uh, forever, you know, and it was always professionals. And there's always a, there's always a competition going on with professionals. So uh, now hanging out more with amateurs, it's more fun because people aren't trying to, you know, get ahead. Uh, it's it's all about learning and sharing and and just enjoying the photography and and wherever we are, out taking pictures and whatever we're taking pictures of and, and it's not a competitive thing. So, so I, I I'm doing more and more workshops because I I really enjoy it. So I'm going to start with uh, sharing the screen here and hopefully my face will will go away online and you see uh, desktop one. Let's start that. And then I come back here and do that. Okay, so everybody online should be seen understanding your camera, just so we know where we are. Now, let me clean something up here for our, our local folks so we can see that better. Okay. Okay. So, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to start it over here. Oops. There's the app. There's the handout if you haven't done it online, but I need to go back and see why I'm not. I need to make a little system change here. Sorry. Or I won't be able to see my notes and then life's going to be bad. Did it to me. So I have multiple monitors going and it gets hard to. There we go. Okay. Okay, let me try sharing again. And okay. Okay, so uh, later uh, in the evening, we're gonna talk about this handout that I have, I posted online. Uh, I have it printed out here for folks locally. So if you haven't downloaded that yet or just looked at it or just, you don't have to download it, just go to the page and, and hit print and you can print the page and, and it'll look pretty good. But we're, what we're gonna talk about tonight is um, Consistent photography, making making consistent photos, and knowing how your camera works is essential to that. So your fancy digital camera does the same things as this this old camera we're seeing here. Um, are you guys? You're not seeing the right thing online, are you? You're seeing. We're seeing your your page. Of yeah, the that's not right. Hang on. We'll get this right yet. Maybe. Now it was. I've lost my Zoom. Sorry about that. Hello. Okay, let's do that. 
Okay, there we go. So um, your fancy digital camera does the same thing as this, this old box camera. And basically all your camera does is controls how much light reaches the back of the camera and then it focuses the light with a lens. And then it has a shutter in it that times how long that light comes through. So we'll talk about how and all that in a couple of minutes, but just, um, you know, when you really think about it, that camera is, is pretty much the same as this woman using her iPad uh, to take a picture. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the technical, some technical things here in a moment, but, but first I wanna talk about something really, really basic, and that is how to hold your camera. And that might sound pretty, pretty trite, but it is uh, uh, extremely important because the most common reason pictures are fuzzy is because the photographer moved the camera while taking the picture, and it's called camera shake or camera movement. So you might see a photo like this, and you say, oh, that looks pretty decent, not too bad. But when you enlarge it, you blow it up, you'll see it's really not too crisp or too sharp. And that's because it was shot handheld not using a tripod, and the camera was moving while the picture was being made. So if you uh, just simply put a tripod under the camera and hold it steady, it looks much better. Now all the other settings were the same for everything, this shot and the other one, but when you blow this up, you see it has really sharp detail. So, you know, the problem, problem wasn't where I focused the camera or that the butterfly or the flower were moving. The problem was that the camera was moving, which is why I almost always use a tripod. I, I'm, I'm a fanatic about it. Uh, I sell prints that are big, uh, 60, 72 inch. I just, uh, just installed a hundred inch print. And if it's the least bit blurry, I'm in trouble. So everything I shoot is with a tripod and that takes some practice, but but it's, it's a, a great, great way to, uh, to go. But if you aren't using a tripod, there's a, uh, a couple of tricks I'm gonna show you. So uh, you wanna hang onto the camera with your right hand real firm, and then put your left hand underneath it, okay? So you want your left hand under the lens, not on top, okay? So if you have, if you have your camera handy, try it. Just, put your hand underneath or versus on top. The difference being, do I have a camera handy? I don't. Um, the, if you just do a little test yourself and just hold your hand out and put your hand down it's fine, um, and, and push down, you'll see you're pretty weak. But if you just turn it over, you're a lot stronger just having your hand this way than this way. So while you have your hand underneath, you still have finger control over the focus if you want to, or if you're using a zoom lens, you can zoom with, the, with your fingers. So uh, just simply by putting their hand underneath, then you, you become much, much stronger and your camera becomes steadier. You also should keep your arms in, keep your elbows in tight. Um, your your you know if your arms are out your elbows are out you're 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 weak but if you can bring them into your body you're 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 a lot stronger now if if your folks are lucky and you have a nice big belly like I do then you can really <laughs> dig your elbows right in there and and I feel sorry for you who don't have a belly maybe someday you'll get one but if you if you get your elbows in there then and you hold that camera like this and you kind of push it against your face you build a tripod and so suddenly you are extremely extremely uh, steady. So for sharp pictures, you wanna hold, hold that camera correctly and, and be in a steady position. And if you are finding that you are getting consistently blurry pictures, you need to use a faster shutter speed, okay? So there's, there's a rule about the shutter speed um, and how, what, what lens you can use. So if you're, it, it's called the, the one over, uh, rule. So if you're using a 50 millimeter lens and your shutter speed needs to be at least one over 50, so a 50th of a second. If you're using a 200 millimeter lens, it needs to be one 200th of a second to build a handhold. 
If it's a 20 millimeter lens, you can go down to a 20th of a second. So whatever, whatever focal length lens you're using, if you think about putting the one over, that should be your shutter speed. Wow. Okay. So how do you determine the millimeter of the lens? So if you have a zoom lens, it, it will, on the top, as you turn it, you'll see it. It depends on what the lens is. Uh, it will show you right on top of the lens there. So as, as you turn it, there's numbers printed on the, on the lens itself. And you will, you will see what, what millimeter. So I'm guessing you have a, uh, let's say like 24 to 70, something like that. Okay. So 24 is, is a, a wide angle and 70 is getting to be a little bit of a, of a telephoto. So some, some cameras and lenses have uh, now built in uh, uh, shake, uh, anti shake mechanism. Um, Nikon calls it vibration reduction. Uh, Canon calls it, uh, my brain just went out. Image stabilization. Image stabilization. Yeah, IS. Uh, uh, I don't remember what Sony calls it. I don't have a Sony. So if you turn that on, you can, you can, you're, you're much, much steadier. But I can just assure you, if you get below a 30th of a second and you're trying to handhold your pictures, they're not going to be super duper sharp. They're just not. Okay. Um, but one other thing that is good, uh, if, if you'd mute yourself, please, I hear some, some background noise. Um, if you need to, if you're hand holding and you're kind of wobbling in the air, just lean up against a wall, like a picture of my friend here. Uh, just, if you just lean against the wall, you're, you're a lot steadier right off the, right off the bat. And I say to be aware of your breath. What's that mean? That means I'm, I'm an exhaler. I exhale and I'm relaxed and then I shoot. Some people inhale and hold their breath and shoot. You don't want to be on the in-between because your body is moving while you're inhaling or exhaling. So it's either inhale, hold your breath, fire, or exhale, fire. Um, you know, while you're going down, while you're exhaling, you're, you're, you know, your whole upper body is moving, so you're going to shake your camera. Uh, and so the, the real trick is to push on your shutter button without moving the camera. Now, when I see something really exciting, I want to just push it. I'm, I'm pushing down and I'm just smacking on that camera and it's rocking and I'm like, holy crap, that's bad. So uh, a little trick that I've come up with is instead of pushing down on your shutter button with the tip of your finger, set your finger right in front of it. There's usually a little room there. And then you just roll your finger back over the shutter release. So you're not really pushing with the end of your finger. You're pushing with more of the middle of your finger and you're a lot steadier. You're not pushing down and and shoving it over. So that takes some practice, but you know, one of the things that, that people who buy a camera think they should go out and be able to shoot great pictures right away. Well, if I buy a violin, I'm not going out and making great music right away. I need to practice. So there are some things you just need to practice on and that's one of them, how to, how to hold your camera and how to just roll your finger back over the shutter button. And if you do all of that, you end up with a pretty nice picture, hopefully. Hopefully. So let's talk about exposure control because that is something that is, is uh, extremely important. Photography is all about capturing light. That's what photography is. It, the camera lets light come through the lens. The lens has an, an aperture that determines how much light comes through the lens. It has a shutter that determines how long that light's coming through the, the lens. And if you're using digital, it has a sensor that uh, varies on how sensitive it is. If you're using film, it has ratings that tell you how sensitive the film is. But all cameras, unless you use one of my old box cameras, has a, a meter in it that meters the light. And so it measures how much light is being reflected into the camera. Okay, it's not how much light is hitting the camera, it's how much is being reflected off of your subject. So in a scene like this, where I'm standing in the shade, but my subject is in the sunshine, I'm, I'm not concerned about where I am, I'm concerned about the bridge out in the sunshine. So the meter in the camera is, is averaging all of that 
light coming into the camera. And it looks at, at, at different parts of it. It looks at the highlights, which are the brightest parts of the picture. It looks at the shadows, which are the darker part of the picture. And it looks at the midtones. And it averages all those together. And it comes up with uh, what's been determined to be an average exposure, uh, no matter what the scene is. And it, and it averages out the light, it ignores color, and it tries to make the overall scene an 18% gray. So if you've ever seen anything in the photo world that is gray, like my walls, 18% gray. And that's what a, a camera is trying to, to shoot. So if you're shooting something like fog, that's what the camera wants every photo to look like. It wants it to be that tone. Doesn't have, could have more different colors, but it wants it all to be that kind of that 18% gray. And so there are lots of times when we're photographing something that's not 18% gray, right? The whole, the overall scene is not. So the meter will not always be right. It'll lie to you. So if you're taking pictures of a black cat, it's going to say, oh, wait a minute, this scene should be gray, not black, right? And your picture comes out gray. And you think, well, that's no good. What happened? Well, the camera says it's too gray, or it needs that black to be gray. And it'll come out like that every time. And so you have to do something uh, to compensate for that. And if you're shooting in one of the automatic modes, which we'll talk about later, you have to do exposure compensation, which we're going to talk more about later. But you just need to know that, uh, okay, so let's get a real high tech term out of the way right now. When you take a picture and you look at it on the back of your camera, that's called chimping. You chimp your photos. That came from the early days of, of digital. A bunch of photographers were at a basketball game and this big play happened in front of them. They all shot it. They pulled up their cameras and went, ooh, 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 ooh. Okay. So you chimp your photos. So when you're chimping your photo and you see that it's gray, you've got to say, wait a minute, I need it to be darker. So you have to make it darker, which is kind of illogical. But if you're shooting something black, you need to make it darker. Same thing happens on the other side. If you're shooting something white, snow or uh, bright uh, beach, the camera's going to say, wait a minute, I don't want that white. I want that gray. And your picture is going to come out looking gray. So you have to shoot. Uh, you have to compensate for that. Um, and uh, there are different modes in your camera to do that. So uh, one of the so there are different exposure modes, and most pros shoot in uh, manual exposure mode because that gives total control of the camera to me instead of whoever programmed it, wherever that was. Who knows? Who knows who programmed it? So when I shoot in manual mode, I I control my aperture, I control my shutter speed and my ISO, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. Um, I recommend that most people starting out get to aperture priority. And so on a Canon camera, it's an AV, which stands for aperture value. Uh, on, a, on a Nikon and on a Sony, it's uh, A. So there should be a dial on top of your camera. It has an A or an AV. And so that's aperture priority. So you set the aperture the camera will set the shutter speed, okay? And you have already, we'll talk about ISO here in a, in a few minutes, but you, you set the ISO also. So uh, aperture lets, lets you set the size of the opening of the lens, the camera will set the shutter speed, okay? We're gonna talk later about why and, and when and why this is better. Uh, your camera also has shutter priority, which on, uh, Canon is a TV on uh, Nikon and Sony, it's S. And so shutter priority, you set the shutter speed, the camera sets the aperture, okay? Just the opposite. So if you know what shutter speed you wanna shoot at, the camera will try to match an aperture that will do that. Now, the reason I don't recommend people using shutter priority is that there are times when you want to use a shutter speed that there's not an aperture available to match that. So in, in my office here right now, it's fairly dark. So if I was trying to get a very fast shutter speed, 
I don't have an aperture big enough. My, you know, my, my opening and my, my lens is only that big. It needs to be about that big. Well, that's not going to happen. So uh, my camera's going to start yelling at me and say, you idiot, you can't do that. And well, maybe not those exact words, but if I was programming, it would. Uh, but it, it just will give you a warning. We can't do that. And if you go ahead and shoot a picture, it's going to be way too dark. But if you're in aperture priority, there is almost always, it's extremely rare that there's not a shutter speed that'll give you the proper exposure to match the aperture you want. Okay. So I recommend aperture priority over shutter priority. There is also uh, just priority mode. And most cameras have a, a P that's not in color on them that stands for priority. That means the camera sets the aperture and the shutter speed. So you get the worst of both worlds out of that. Because who knows what they're going for there? Who knows? And we're gonna talk about why later. Um, there's also uh, usually a green uh, P or uh, a an, uh, green auto on your camera. That stands, the P stands for program. So then the camera sets the aperture, the shutter speed and the ISO and you really get a triple whammy of who knows what the hell you're getting out of that creatively. Uh, if, you're, if you're totally uncomfortable with your exposure, if you put it on, on on priority mode or or on the full auto, you're going to get a pretty decent exposure most of the time. Now, I I I don't have scientific proof, but I'm I've figured that about 85% of the time, uh, in one of these automatic modes, the camera will get the exposure pretty darn close. 15% of the time, it won't, depending on what you're photographing. If you're on a on a sunny beach tomorrow, it's going to miss all of them. It's going to make everything gray instead of white. So if 85% is good enough for you, that's great. For me, if I'm losing 15% of my photos right off the bat, I'm in trouble. You know, I, I'm, in, I'm in trouble. So I, I don't want to lose 15%. That's why I go to uh, manual mode. So there are some other uh, modes on there that, that are known as creative exposure modes. So they will select the shutter speed and the aperture and add some built-in things. So you might have a picture of a candle on top. You might have a picture of a flower or a picture of a person running, something like that. So if you're, if you have the running picture, it's it thinking you're shooting action. So it's going to give you the best settings for action. If you're shooting uh, a candle, it's going to say, oh, it's probably a low light situation. So it's going to try to give you the best, best settings for low light. Um, so those are, are okay, um, but they, they, you know, again, they're programmed by somebody who's doing it to, to be general and, and when you're starting out, that's not horrible, but pretty quick you wanna get off of that, okay? Okay, any questions on that? So what is the difference between the P mode and the auto mode? What's the difference between the P mode and the auto mode? Uh, so if it's just, has a P on it with an P is not green. That means it's priority and the camera is setting both the shutter speed and the aperture, but not the ISO. The, the full auto or a P, a green P, uh, it sets all three of them for you automatically every, on every picture. It changes. Okay. So we're going to talk about those three things right now. So, uh, so what your camera controls is the exposure and that's using the exposure triangle, which sounds so, so uh, important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the exposure triangle, how scary. And the exposure triangle is made up of three things, shutter speed, aperture, which is the lens opening and your ISO. So to get a proper exposure, it's a combination of those three things, an equal combination of aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And so there is a, a symbiotic relationship between those three. If you have a proper exposure and you change one of them, you have to change one of the other two to maintain a proper exposure, okay? So uh, shutter speed is how long light hits the sensor, how long your shutter is open. So if you think of your shutter as a, a curtain that goes open and closed, uh, the longer it's open, you know, the slower it goes, the, the more light hits it. Aperture is the size of the hole uh, of your lens. 
and ISO is how sensitive the sensor is to light. And we're going to talk about all three of these more in depth. Starting with ISO. So the higher the ISO, the bigger the number, the more sensitive the sensor is to light, which sounds great. But the higher the ISO, the lower the quality. So as your ISO gets higher, the quality gets lower. So common ISOs are 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, something like that. If you're mathematically inclined, you might notice those numbers are doubling as you go through there. So um, the, less, the lower the number, the more light is needed to make an exposure, okay? So if you, if you uh, are out on a bright sunny day, you might want to use 100 or 200 or 400. If you, uh, some cameras don't have, some cameras the lowest is 200, so uh, you might not have a 100. Uh, the newer Sonys are, are dropping some down to 64, so you might be getting at 64. Uh, but if you're shooting people at night, you want to raise that, you might want to raise that ISO up uh, in the 1600 or 3200 range. So, I shoot everything, almost everything, at ISO 100 because that's the best quality possible. Now, everybody in the world doesn't need the absolute best quality for every photo you take. So I have to go to extremes sometimes while I'm working to shoot at ISO 100. One of those extremes is using a tripod. But um, I, I got a new camera not too long ago, and one of the first things I did was go out and take a series of pictures and set the ISO at 100, click, ISO at 200, click, ISO at 400, click, 800, all the way up. And then I put those photos in my computer, and I looked at them to see at what point does my quality become so bad that I never want to go there again. Where's, where's the tipping point? And it was uh, about 6,400. You know, there's a bunch of numbers much bigger than that on there. But I never, I never want to go there because the quality is just so bad that um, it, it, it just doesn't work. So one of the tests you should do is just go out and take a picture of, and it's good to do something colorful. Um, that way you can see the quality of the colors will change, but you also will get noise in it and, and, and it will, it will uh, affect things. So, yep, do we have a question? Can I ask a question? Um, does, sure. this, does this correlate to uh, film speed when people used to use film? Absolutely, absolutely. Film, film was rated, it's in, essentially, in theory, the same. So film, used to, film comes in speeds of, you know, Kodachrome was 600, or 64, not 600. Uh, the old Kodachrome was 32. But uh, most slide films and, and, and negative films and black and white are 100, two, or 200, 400. Uh, you can get some 800 speed films. So, yes, in, in, in theory, theory, it is about the same. Thank you. You bet. Yes? Um, you said about ISO, shooting at ISO 100. Is it same for the indoor shooting as well as the outdoor shooting? So the, so the question is, uh, I, I say I shoot at 100. For me, yes, I shoot indoors at 100 if I need my quality. Um, so that might mean I need additional lighting. So it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm taking pictures of my dog running around, am I worried about the quality? No, I'm not going to make a 60-inch print of my dog. My wife might want me to, but... Um, uh, Actually, I have a 48-inch print of my dog hanging in the in the kitchen, but I shot that in studio, so I was at 100 with that. Um, so it, it depends what you're doing, but what you know. Remember, we have a, an exposure triangle, so there's three things we have to worry about to get a proper exposure. So I say, pick an exposure for the day and forget it. You know, make it 400. Set your ISO at 400, and don't worry about it again. Then you only have two things to worry about, and for me, if I can eliminate 33% of the things I have to think about, I'm in much better shape, right? So pick one. And, and you know, if you're outside shooting all day, you know, 400 is going to probably, you know, if your camera is less than four years old, you're, it's going to look pretty darn good. If it's older than that, 400 might be a little grainy, might not. Uh, depends on the camera. 
Uh, if it's 10 years old, it's going to look pretty rough. But so setting the speed is which of those number, which of those letters is it A, P, or S? I'm sorry. So we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay, it, okay. So the question is, which of those aperture priority or shutter priority is that? None of them. Okay. So your camera has a place in it where you set the ISO. Okay. Um, uh, every okay. camera is different. I can't show you a slide that says this is where it is because every camera is different. Um, it will definitely be in the menus. Some of them have a, a quick button to hit that will set it really fast. So you can change it really fast. Um, but that's something if you don't know where it is, you know, look that up in your in your book for your, you know, it'll be it'll be fairly obvious. And that's you know that's a very important thing to learn is how to change your ISO. Um, um, and does the ISO change with the uh, the age of the camera? Like with the with the age of the if the camera is getting older, you get more grains. No, the older sensors. The older sensors didn't handle higher ISOs as well as new sensors do. So that's one of the improvements that the camera companies have made in the, the quality of the sensor is uh, it does a better job handling the uh, high ISO. So I just, you know, I just said the camera that I, uh, that I got and replacing the camera that I had before, if I went above 800 on my ISO, it just looked like garbage. It was, it was grainy and noisy and colors were muted and, and so it, I had that a massive jump from 800 to 3200 just by getting a new camera body. The, the body I have now will, will not deteriorate with time um, but you know in, in three years there'll be a, a new one that's even better and you can get an even higher ISO and, and maintain good quality which is the key. Okay any other questions on ISO? Okay, set it and forget it. So then there's the aperture. So the aperture controls how much light is coming through the lens, right? And apertures are measured in f-stops. And f-stops are numbered in things like f4, f5.6, f8. Um, and this is the most confusing thing in photography. This will drive you batty faster than anything. And the guy who thought this up, I, I need to figure out who he was because I'm going to make a journey and spit on his grave. I hope, I'm, I'm assuming he's dead because it would have happened a long, long time ago. Uh, he, he was a sadistic bastard because the bigger the number, the smaller the opening. Okay, the bigger the number, the smaller the opening. So one of the things on my handout that, that is helpful is F4 has a bigger opening than F16. Okay, so F4 lets in a lot more light than F16 because the hole gets smaller. So if you think of it as, uh, you know, like uh, using a, a, a garden hose versus a fire hose versus, uh, you know, a little, little faucet, you know, the bigger the opening, the more, the more juice comes through, the more light comes through, okay? So every time you change your aperture to let in less light, you're stopping down. So the amount of light that actually enters is cut in half. So you go from F8 to F11 you're getting half as much light. Uh, and the opposite is true. If you go from F, F16 to F11, you're letting in twice as much light and that's opening up. So uh, there are what's known as full F-stops. So it's F2.8, F4, F5.6, F8, F11, F16, F22. In the old days, you needed to know that and you needed to have that really down. Now you really don't. You just, need to, you just really need to understand that if you want more light in your picture, one way to do that is, is opening up your f-stop, meaning making a bigger hole, which means a smaller number. That sick bastard, right? So um, carry this with you and you're thinking, which way do I go to get more light? That is going to show you right away. Okay, you can just look at that, okay? But doesn't so, that, doesn't that question? Impact, yeah, doesn't that have an impact on the depth of field, though? Oh, absolutely, and we're going to talk about that next. Okay, good. <laughs> Other question? Okay. So I typed this slide really fast while you're asking that question. No. Um, so, 
Let's do the full stops. Uh, these stops are called as full stops. So these are full full f stops. Yes. So if you're mathematically inclined, you'll notice that 2.8 is half of 5.6, and f4 is f half of eight. And so there's there there can be math involved, but there doesn't have to be. Uh, I see some faces going, oh no, math. Uh, in the in the old days before the mechanical before the automatic things you needed to know your math or your which when, is when you, when you say like there's more light it's less focused does that mean what you're shooting at and the background as well or is one well we're going to talk about that in a moment here so so one of the things that aperture controls is depth of field depth of field is how much of your subject or how much of the picture is acceptably in focus. So there are times when you wanna have absolutely everything in focus. There are times when you might wanna have selective focus and only have just a little bit of the picture in focus. So um, uh, aperture is one of the things that controls your depth of field. So uh, uh, again, aperture, how much light comes through the lens, but it, it controls the depth of field. Now it's actually, there are four things that control depth of field and they're all equal. Uh, one of them is the size of your sensor. So while you're out shooting, you can't change that. So that really doesn't factor in. Uh, one of them is your aperture. So uh, F4 has less depth of field than F16. And we're gonna talk more about this too. Uh, the other thing is how close you are to your subject. The closer you are, the less depth of field you have. And uh, the final thing is uh, uh, what lens uh, focal length you're using. So a telephoto lens has less depth of field than a wide angle lens. So any lens below 50, a 50 millimeter lens or below, below 50 is a wide angle lens. Above 50 millimeters is a telephoto lens. So. Could you repeat that last part? You said three, uh, four. Size of sensor aperture, how close you are to the subject. And focal length of your lens. Okay. So whether you're using a telephoto lens or, or a, a wide angle. Okay, so a wide angle has more depth of field than a telephoto. Now on Lauren's fancy handout, you'll see this really, really instructive line showing that at, at F4, your background is less in focus than at F16, your background is more in focus. So as you go through, it becomes a gradual thing, okay? So why do we care? Somebody must have asked. Well, it's one of the great creative controls of a camera. So the picture on the left is shot at F4. The picture on the right is F16. The only thing that changed was the aperture. Now, because of exposure triangle, when I changed the aperture, I had to change the shutter speed also, right? Or my exposure would have been off. So, uh, but, uh, you know, the picture on the left has selective focus, just the flower in the front in focus. Picture on the right has everything in focus. Which one's better? Yeah, it depends. It's a creative control. It's, it's what you're saying with your photo. So when we're in aperture priority, how do we select what aperture we're going to use is, well, do I want a lot of depth of field or a little? Or doesn't it matter? So, you know, it's, it's amazing. There's a person in the picture on the left. You don't see them because they're so far out of focus. So in the picture on the left, I'm saying, wow, look at this beautiful flower garden uh, or beautiful group of flowers. And on the right, it's, wow, this must be a public garden. There's people walking around in the background and look at all of them. And again, the only thing that changed was the aperture. So uh, same thing here. Uh, the one on the left, F16. The one on the right, F4. On the left, you see a brick wall behind the plant. On the right, it's gone. Again, I changed the aperture. And when I changed the aperture, I had to change the shutter speed to maintain a proper exposure. But creatively, all I did was think, do I want to have a lot of depth of field or little? Hmm. Hmm. Lauren. Yes. I have a question about, um, you said when the change in aperture requires an equal change in shutter speed, does it go, yes. does it go up or down? Or how does that work? Well. If, if you look at Lauren's fancy chart, it tells you down the next line. So um, 
on a sunny day, if you're shooting ISO 100 at F4, your, your shutter speed will be one two thousandth of a second every day. Because what determines the exposure is how far your light source is from your subject. The sun's the same distance from the earth every day, right? So the light's the same. Now, if it's cloudy or, you know, there's other factors, but on a clear, sunny day, uh, F4, one two thousandth of a second. So if I decide, okay, I'm going to shoot some at F4, now I'm going to go to F16. If I'm an aperture priority, my camera's going to change that for me and drop my shutter speed down to one one twenty fifth of a second. If I'm doing it manually, I have to manually move it down to one one twenty fifth of a second. Okay, so if I'm shooting with a 300 millimeter lens, uh-oh, I'm in trouble down here at 1 25th of a second if I'm hand holding because that's not one over 300, that's one over 125. I'm gonna get some camera shake, okay? Thank you. So I, we'll, we'll talk more about that, about the camera shake again, but, but you know, it's, so the same thing happens the other way. If, if I started out shooting at F16 at 1 25th of a second, and I want to go to F4, my, my shutter speed is going to jump up to one two thousandth of a second. Okay, and we're going to talk about what, how that, what shutter speed affects here in a little bit. But, and so like this picture shot at F4, so you can see maybe uh, the middle of the picture is in, in sharp focus, but the foreground is out of focus and the background's out of focus. Okay, when I go to F16, Everybody's in focus. So why the foreground normally the background is out of focus, right? Or, uh... So the question is normally the foreground is in focus and the background's out. No, that depends on where you're focusing. So uh, when I go back to the first one, so um, uh, the the technical uh, physics of focusing are your depth of field. Uh, you get twice as much in focus behind what you're shooting as in front. Okay, so you get twice as much. So if you're shooting something uh, six feet away, your depth of field would might be three feet in front and then uh, back to 12 feet behind, depending on, on your, you know, all, all three of their, what lens, what shutter, or what, uh, what lens, what aperture, and how far away you are. But you you always get you always have twice as much in focus as in front. Now, if you're focusing at infinity, if you focus, you know, staying at the Grand Canyon, you focus on the other side of Grand Canyon, you know, everything's gonna be in focus because you're shooting far away, and and the farther away something is, the more in focus. So, if you're trying to if you're trying to do this at the Grand Canyon and shoot the other side, you can't because it's too far away. One of the factors of depth of field is how far away the subject is. Okay, um, so uh, F4, I'm saying, you know, what am I saying here? There's these gravestones and if there's somebody, you know, a loved one on there, that, that would be important. But this picture says, well, kind of a cool looking old graveyard, you know, totally, totally different story. F4, F16. Totally changes the look of the picture. Creative uh, control. I one more question. <coughs> Sorry if I sure. Um, how do you determine I have to use F4 here? Like, why can't I use F8 instead of, you know? So the question is, uh, how do I determine F4 or why not use F8? So when, I'm, when I find something that makes me go, ooh, I want to take a picture of that, one of the first things I think of, I think about, not of, I think about, is do I want to have a lot of this scene in focus or do I want to have a little bit? And so I have to determine that creatively right away. The faster I determine it, the faster I start shooting. If I have to sit there and go, hmm, I'm not sure. You know, so the reality is I probably will shoot some at F4, I'll shoot some at F8 and I'll shoot some at F16 and make the big decision when I get back there and look at it in the computer. You know, I, I, never, I never see something and take one shot of it. Oh, got it. Nope. I ain't that good. I ain't that good. And I don't want to be that good because that takes all the creativity out of photography. Yep. Got it. Okay. Move on. No, I'm, I'm taking pictures at different apertures, different shutter speeds, different lenses to see how it changes the look of the photo because it makes a huge difference on every photo. 
okay? So when I come up to a scene like this, my first question is, do I want a lot of depth of field or a little? Okay, so is this F4 or F16? F16. F16, right. The flowers are in focus in the foreground. The house on the other side of the covered bridge is in focus. F16 has to be. F4 or F16? F16. F16, right. So uh, uh, wheat field in Tuscany. I wanted the wheat in the foreground in focus and, and everything in the background in focus, right? F4 or F16? F4. I wanted a very selective focus. I wanted those grapes to stand out. If I shot that with lots of depth of field, then they would just blur right into the background and, and they would not become a strong center of interest for me. Pretty easy, isn't this stuff easy, huh? F4 or F16? I hear everybody saying F16, right. We have the foreground in focus and the far backgrounds in focus, right? So as I, you know, so I, I, I will tell you one of the things that I, I, I love shooting sunrise, just love the light at sunrise, hate getting out of bed. So every time you see a sunrise picture from me, I'm gonna let you know that I got my lazy butt out of bed. This is a sunrise picture, okay. Just I'm gonna take credit for getting my butt out of bed. So. You know, I'm standing out there in the middle of a country road in Vermont, you know, barely awake thinking, do I want a lot of depth of field or a little here? This is a pretty easy decision. Yep, I want a lot. Okay, I need to be up around F, F11, F16, F22 in that range. You know, which one exactly? A scene like this doesn't make a whole lot of difference. F4 or F16? Four. I think four. Uh, I heard an F8. It, it, you're probably close. So is the foreground in focus? Pretty much. Is the background in focus? A little bit. Right. So so part of it is. So I'm I'm you know, I'm in focus in this area, but way back there, I'm out. Okay. So part of the reason is this was shot with a telephoto, so I don't have complete depth of field, but it was shot at F8. Oh, it is. Uh, so a telephoto, I'm going to have less depth of field than a wide angle. So this one's a wide angle shot. Right. So, so that helps give me more depth of field also. So if I want, if I know I want to have an extreme amount of depth of field, I'm pulling out the widest lens I can get my hands on, and I'm going down to f16 or f22. Okay. So most lenses, um, whatever you know, every every lens has a different minimum and maximum aperture, right? So uh, the the widest opening might be 2.8. It might be 4.5. If it's a zoom lens. Um, it might vary as you as you zoom through the range. So it might be uh, if you have like a, a 70 to 200 lens, it might be 4.5 or 3.5 at at uh, 70, and then when you get to 200, it might be 5.6. So every lens varies, uh, are, are, are different. Um, so when I when I want to make sure I get a lot of depth of field, I I get that. Oh, so I, what what I was saying is uh, so the 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 minimum opening number also varies. Most lenses, and especially the less expensive ones, uh, if f22 is the smallest uh, opening, that is probably the least sharp opening also. So I rarely want to be at the extreme on the number that is the biggest. Rarely want to be at that extreme because the quality is going to drop off. So if you just go from f16 or f22 to f16, the quality is going to be a lot better. Just it's just the physics of building lenses. When you start buying two thousand dollar lenses, that doesn't happen as much, but it still happens. So um, you you want to not shoot a lot at f twenty two if f twenty two is the biggest number you have, which is means the smallest opening, right? Okay. So that's why with telephoto, yeah, great. F four or F sixteen. I'm going to tell you it's one of the two. 
F4, right. All right. Because I wanted the birds to stand out. I didn't want them to blend in with that background. So by using that F4, just throws that background out of focus and really makes the birds come through. F4, F16. Four. It's F4, right. Because there's not much depth of field. Well, so the trees in the foreground are out of focus. But if you look at the ground, there's not much depth there. There's not much in focus on the ground itself. So that tells you that it's a, a, it's a pretty big opening. Not much depth of field happening there, right? And the background's totally out. So again, makes the fox kit face just jump right out of the picture, right? F4 or F16? F16. F4. I was waiting for somebody to say that. Okay, trick question again. This is an F8. <laughs> this is in the middle. So sometimes you want to be in the middle. So I want to have the background a little bit in focus, but I wanted it a little bit out of focus because I want the eye of the viewer to be concentrated on the person in the foreground. This is a, a, the grooviest dude ever on the beach in Hawaii. And I just had to say, dude, show me your guns. And he, he had no problem doing that. You know, he was all blinged up. And so, so I, I wanted him to stand out, but I didn't want to throw the background totally out of focus and lose context of where I am. So uh, in order to not have him uh, have the background be totally in focus, I go to F8, so I, I'm in between. So I get a little bit of, little bit of, you know, you know we're we're on the beach. F four or F sixteen. Sixteen. So in theory, F sixteen, right? In reality, two point eight. Whoa. Because I'm using an extreme wide angle lens. So remember one of the one of the uh, things that controls depth of field is uh, how wide your lens is and how far away you are from the subject. So I'm using a, a very wide angle lens and I'm about 15 to 20 feet away from the trees. So focusing on the trees and then the Milky Way in the background are all in infinity with an extreme wide angle lens. So it gets everything in focus. Okay. So uh, with a wide angle lens, uh, the far, the wider your lens, the more depth of field you have. So this is with a 16 millimeter lens and, and that will just automatically give you a lot of depth of field if you're focused farther away. If you're focused two inches away, you're not going to get much depth of field, but this I'm focused about 20 feet away. So I'm going to get from 20 feet to infinity in focus. Not a problem. That's Savannah, yes. Did you use F4 or F16? I didn't know how to use my camera. Just shoot automatic. Just shoot automatic and you, and you, you hope that everything came out the way you wanted it to look. So yeah, this is 11, 16. So a lot of depth of field, you know, the, the sidewalk in the foreground's in focus and the, the background's pretty much in focus. Live oaks. So you can see as you're looking at photos, anytime you look at a photo, you can determine what they used as an F-stop in a range. You know, it you won't be exact, but any photo, you know, you look at this Mount Hood in Oregon and you say, oh, you must have shot that with F-16. Right? So people are always asking me, what, what f-stop do you use? Look at the picture. You can figure it out. <laughs> you know, you can. And that's a learning tool. You know, as you're looking at photos, hey. Yeah. Do you normally go beyond f-16 in these kind of scenarios? Do I normally go beyond f-16? No, because uh, f-22 is the, the biggest number I have on that lens. And I don't want to shoot at 22 very often uh, because my quality will drop off. Uh, especially when the, the corners get get soft, so I I just back it off to 16 and and uh, shoot there. 
Did you have a special filter on for that shot? No filter. Hmm. Nope. How did you get the clouds in there? I, I talked to them really nice. <laughs> um, oh, oh, this is another sunrise picture. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the light was just, uh, just beautiful. And, and I, I, uh, I varied my exposures. So, you know, I shot a ton of shots, just, you know, just tried a whole bunch of different things and you know, don't have to hit it right exactly on one shot. You know, what time of day? Sunrise. What, like five o'clock or six? Uh, uh, six, six ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. So it was in August in Oregon. So sunrise would be about six. Yeah. Yes, that is also with a wide angle lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which helps with the field. It does. Yeah. Okay. Any big questions about uh, aperture? I don't have a question, Lauren, but I want to say thank you for someone that is mathematically challenged. You have definitely made that f stop very easy to understand for the cool. first time in a long time. <laughs> Good. And when you when you start getting confused again, pull out the chart. And I say, have it. Look at that number, it makes a bigger hole. That number means a littler hole. That's all you really need to know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For a while. Until, I don't know when. You never need to know more than that. It helps, but it doesn't hurt. Um, okay. Any other, any, other, any other high praise you'd like to pour upon me at this point? Well, just, just kidding. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, shucks. No. Okay. So uh, let's move on to shutter speed. Okay, so we remember that shutter speed can, uh, is how long your, your camera is exposed. So it, re it controls how motion is recorded. Okay, so a fast shutter speed will freeze motion. And a slower shutter speed will show something that's moving as a blur, which can be a creative tool, right? So if you're shooting something moving like sports, you want, and, you want to, and you want to freeze the action, you want to use a shutter speed of one five hundredth of a second or faster or more. So one five hundredth of a second, one seven fifty, one one thousandth, one two thousandth, that kind of thing. If you're just shooting a, a portrait or something that isn't moving, one one twenty fifth is probably pretty good. Um, uh, and if you remember from uh, earlier on, you know, you want to make sure your shutter speed is fast enough to eliminate camera shake. So if you're using a 50 millimeter lens, you want to at least have a 50th of a second. If you're using a 20 millimeter lens, you can have a 20th of a second. 200 millimeter lens, you can get for one 200th of a second if you're hand holding. Okay. So a fast shutter speed freezes action. So this is one 1,000th one of a second. So anything moving is going to be frozen in time, right? Uh, and so that's a, a creative control. Uh, so, uh, a, a shot like this, you know, I want to make sure I'm getting a fast enough shutter speed that everything doesn't become a blur, but there is a little bit of movement in there because it was a fairly low light situation. So if you're as old as I am, you might remember Jerry Cooney, the, the fighter, uh, uh, Jerry lives not too far away from me here in New Jersey and, and, uh, he's just a great guy and, and he does fundraisers for nonprofits and he will train five or six guys and then they'll put up a boxing ring and people will come and, and Jerry will do three rounds with them and, and people, you know, they raise money. And so during the training, uh, I was working at the newspaper at the time and, and one of the sports writers who was not very big decided that he would train with Jerry. And so Jerry, uh, I got to know him fairly well. And, and he, he, uh, he says, you know, every, every guy I train, I hit him once just so they know what it feels like. You know, I'm not going to hurt them, but I'm going to hit them once so they know what it feels like. And so uh, this day he said, okay, it's, it's your sports writer's turn today. And I said, okay. So I needed to make sure I had my shutter speed fast enough that when that fist went out and caught little Harry right in the face, I, I was going to get it. So, you know, we're shooting, I'm shooting there out there sparring a little bit. Jerry looks over to me and kind of gives me a little wink. So I know it's coming, right? <laughs> Here it comes, but he didn't let Harry know. You know, so he popped him pretty good, and and I was just the hero in the sports department at the newspaper because I got the shot. 
but I had to make sure I had my shutter speed fast enough. If I was doing a slow shutter speed, I'd be in trouble because the motion would be a blur and, and, uh, and uh, it, I, would, I would miss the shot. So uh, this is actually one two fiftieth of a second. Uh, you can see there's some movement in, in the leg of, of uh, Harry down here. There's a little bit of movement in his head here because it was snapping back pretty good. Uh, uh, and fortunately, I was never stupid enough to get in there and let Jerry Cooney smash my face. But it was a lot of fun. So uh, times you want to have really fast shutter speed. Then there's times when you want to have a really slow shutter speed. I'm uh, photographing a covered bridge in Vermont. And uh, this is a 30 second exposure. And as the cars drive through the bridge, their taillights are making this beautiful color. So I'm, I'm standing there and, and a cop comes up and wants to know what's going on. And I say, yeah, I'm, it could be because I'm also using a flashlight to light up the bridge. So I said, oh, I'm just light painting and, and you know, hopefully a car drives through and I get these beautiful streaks. And he says, you want me to turn my blue lights on for you? I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. That's awesome. That'd be very nice. So he drives around the block and comes back and drives through and has, you know, how fast do you want me to go? I said, just a normal pace, just drive right on through. So I said, just keep your foot on the brake while you're doing too, because that'll give me an extra red light. So he did, and I got blue lights, red lights, and and just nice light. But the the you know, if I was using a fast shutter speed, it would freeze the car, right? You'd see the car. But by using a really slow shutter speed, car essentially disappears, and all you see is the light that that burned in. So it's a great effect. Now you can't. Um, I think I've tried that before. If there's like a lot of light out, you can't make shots like that. So the question is, if, it's, if there's a lot of light outside, you can't make shots like that exactly because you can't get a shutter speed slow enough and the blurry, the, the red lights are going to blend into the background. So this is about 45 minutes after sunset. So um, every day, twice a day, there's this thing called the blue hour. So the sky turns this color blue every night, no matter the weather, uh, for about 20 minutes. 15 minutes, depends on the day. Um, and it's called the blue hour. So it's about 45 minutes after sunset or 45 minutes before sunrise to 20 minutes before that. So about an hour before sunrise. And no matter the day, the weather, the sky turns this blue, the blue hour. Uh, don't know why it's called an hour. Uh, actually, I read it's a bastardization of a French term. But um, that's a very creative thing to use. So you see a lot of a lot of night photos that are actually shot during the blue hour. So there's still a little color in that sky that makes it a lot better. And you've, you've seen the blue hour when you're out. If you're out driving around at dusk and all the lights and all the uh, houses look yellow, that's your eye adjusting for the color of the blue sky and making it daylight feel. But the house lights are yellow. And your camera doesn't do that adjustment. It just says, hmm, blue, let's get it. Right? So, so that's why the camera records totally different of what you're seeing. You'll be standing there, and, and if you look and think about it, you go, oh, yeah, this guy's got this really nice deep blue going on. So uh, blue hour is a fun time to shoot. So you have hey, to Lauren. Let me get the online. Go ahead, online. Oh, um, I just have a question. So going back to that picture that you um, had us print out, if you are choosing um, a higher shutter speed, like 1, 2,000, would you then choose the f-stop based on that too, kind of correspond it, or is that something – Different. Exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. So, so if you, if you, so m remember my chart showing you daylight, so you're not going to be able to get a 30 second exposure. So this is, this shot is, is, you know, it's pretty dark out. Most people are saying it's nighttime. You can't shoot pictures. Well, yeah, you can. So it's a 30 second exposure ISO 100 at F8. Um, and so, uh, at, as, as you know, the, the light changes, you know, a cloudy day, you're not going to get the same exact numbers as on my chart, but the relationship is going to be the same. Okay. Did that answer the question? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Okay, let's get it completely instead of pretty much. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so, 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 yes, there are times when, I, when I'm looking at my scene and, and my decision is, do I want a lot of depth of field or a little? And then my second decision, and doesn't have to be in that order, is do I need a fast shutter speed or a slow? 
you know, should I, do I need a fast, do I want to freeze the action or do I want to make something that's moving a blur? Hmm, okay. So in a scene like this, you know, a, a nice snowstorm in, in Vermont, uh, you know, a fairly fast shutter speed because I'm freezing that snow falling, right? So it looks, you know, like a, a nice soft snowfall. When I change my shutter speed, so this was about uh, uh, 2 50th of a second. So it's going to stop those snowflakes as they're falling. When I drop it down to 15th of a second, I've made a totally different picture, haven't I? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm saying something totally different. So, you know, which one's, which one's better? You know, the one on the left says, oh, my God, look at that snowstorm. The one on the right, oh, isn't that a pretty snowfall? right taking you know a minute apart just by changing my shutter speed and of course when i changed my shutter speed i had to change my aperture to maintain a proper exposure but in this case my aperture and my depth of field don't matter right because i'm focused on the front of that bridge and the snow and so so my choice here was do i want a fast shutter speed or slow my answer was yes so I try them both because I, you know, which one's going to come out right? I don't know. You know, I mean, you know, which one's, which one's better. And then I, I say, do I, am I, do I need a lot of depth of field or a little? The answer is no, <laughs> doesn't matter. You know, depth of field doesn't matter in a shot like this, but the shutter speed does. So I use settings that, that, uh, you know, I try one with a fast shutter speed, try one with a slow shutter speed cool thing. So I'm sure you've seen waterfalls that look nice and glossy or, or soft and cottony and glass-like silky. And to do that, you need to have at least a two second shutter speed. Your shutter needs to be open at least two seconds to make your waterfalls, your moving water look silky. Okay. Um, if it's a bright sunny day, you can't do that. You, you just there's ain't physics won't let you you can't get two second exposure because you don't have an aperture small enough to let in a little enough light to do that um, so you may heard have heard about neutral density filters neutral density filters are just filters that cut off how much light is coming through the lens they're just gray they don't have any color they don't affect anything other than it's like putting on sunglasses uh, that aren't polarized or color. They just make things darker. So if you want to shoot uh, waterfalls or moving water like this during a day, you put on a, a filter to block out the light. It's called neutral density. Now, the problem happens when you're shooting two second exposures is, what if the wind's blowing? Well, on days like that, you don't do two second exposures. <laughs> you know, because those leaves are going to be just this massive blur too. Right, and if you look real close, you'll see uh, where are they up in here? There's some that are, you know, that that right in there. That's pretty blurry up the top. That one's pretty blurry, you know. So you look around; they are moving a little bit, but if they're, you know, if they're moving like crazy, you don't shoot it unless you want that. You know, you try it and see what it looks like. But if that's the look you're not wanting, well, you've got to come up with an angle that gets that out of the picture, right? Right. Okay, so again, shutter speed controls how long the shutter stays open uh, and controls whether action is stopped or blurred, right? So one, one one thousandth of a second stops action, one fifteenth of a second, if anything's moving, it's gonna be blurry and full, full f-stops are one one thousand, one two, one fifty, one five hundredth of a second, one two fifty, one one twenty fifth, one sixtieth, one thirty, one fifteen. You mathematically inclined are noticing those are doubling. Hmm. Don't need to know that, but at some point it helps. Okay. So let's play the game again. Fast shutter speed or slow? So well, let me make sure I'm getting my terms right here for you. So I, I might cross talk here. I do that often and I've been yelled at many times. So a fast shutter speed and a short shutter speed are the same thing. A long shutter speed and a slow shutter speed are the same thing. So if I, if I 
intertwine those, that's okay. So is this a fast shutter speed or a short shutter speed? See more on the fast side. Yeah, more on the fast side because the dog and the woman are frozen in time, right? If they weren't in there, would it matter what the shutter speed is? Not unless there's an earthquake going on, you know, because the buildings aren't going to be moving. So, so this was a case where, okay, what's, what's more important to me? Shutter speed? You know, what's, do I want to have a fast shutter speed? Well, kind of fast. And I want to have some depth of field. So I'm picking the numbers that are, are in the middle of my chart that are going to give me both some depth of field and some motion control, right? So this is uh, uh, probably, uh, so that's not exactly bright daylight. So that's about 2 50th of a second at, at F8. Okay. Fast shutter speed or slow? Sunrise. Sunrise. I got just let you know I got out of bed. Early sunrise. Fast shutter speed or slow? Fast. Fast. The breaking waves are frozen in time, right? They don't look that soft, glassy, or cottony look, uh, silky look, right? They're frozen. It's just that. So, uh, question is what, what, what aperture? Is there a lot of depth of field or a little? It's more, right? So, the F8 or F16? Right. So, the aperture is going to be F8, F16, and it's also shot with an extreme wide angle lens. In the in the next advanced class, I'll teach you how to how to recognize advanced or uh, uh, wide angle versus uh, telephoto lenses. Any photo you can break down technically. You can say I know what aperture they used, I know what uh, shutter speed they used, and I know what lens they used. You can you can you can get fooled, but you you're in a general range. Okay, fast shutter speed or slow? Fast. Pretty fast. So I was in Guatemala and, and pulled up to a stoplight and this woman ran out with her one kid in her arm and her other daughter jumps up on her back and starts juggling. That's how they make their living, right? So when I'm driving around, I have my camera preset with a fast shutter speed in case something great happens. That's from my old news days, but I still do that. So as we pull up to the stoplight and she runs out there, I just hang out the window and start firing and, and I have a fast shutter speed on because I know that's going to be probably the most important to me right away. And so, uh, you know, stop the motion of the balls in the air and the car going around the corner and, and the light turned green and they didn't get run over. So that was, that was good. Fast shutter speed or slow? Slow. Slow, slow right. Now, why are some of the birds heads in focus and the rest aren't? Camera motion. So it's called panning. So I'm using about a 15th of a second. And so a 15th of a second, anything moving is gonna be a blur. But I'm also moving my camera at the same speed the birds are flying past. Now, I can guarantee you, nobody shoots one picture and gets it, right? You're shooting hundreds. So you just pan, you try to move at the same speed the birds are going by. So you get their, you know, some of them you'll see their heads are in focus but their wings are out of focus because they're moving the same speed as the, as the, as the camera, but the up and down movement still gives you that blur. Fun little trick. That's down in Cape May, New Jersey. If you've never been to Cape May, New Jersey in, in May, yeah, an amazing place, an amazing, amazing place. Uh, all the horseshoe crabs come up on the, Lay millions of eggs and millions of birds are there to eat them. Fast shutter speed or slow? A little trickier. Fairly fast. So the water waves coming in off the ocean onto the black sand beaches of Iceland are frozen in time, right? So Wanted to make sure I had fast enough shutter speed to, to freeze that action. And also enough depth of field to get everything in focus. So I wanted the foreground in focus and the background in focus. Now there are times when you say, wait, I want to have a lot of depth of field and 
a fast shutter speed, but I can't get it. That's when you go to the third thing on your exposure triangle and increase your ISO. Because remember, they're all three of them work together. So if you want to have, you know, if, if you if you do, this is based on ISO 100. If you do want to have f16, but you want to have one two thousandths of a second, if you increase your ISO, you can get that. Now, I, I always work around it. This is one, ISO 100. Everything you've seen is ISO 100. How about the type of uh, file that you should set your camera on? Like different file types. Uh, the question is about file types. Uh, we're going to talk about that later. Okay. Real soon. A couple more slides, then we're going to talk about file types. Um, fast shutter speed or slow? No. Slow. How long would you guess? Two seconds. Great guess. It's actually five, but but it has to be at least two seconds to get that nice silky moving water look. Now, the faster the water's moving, the you know the more it becomes a blur. But but you tell me what f stop. Is there a lo lot of depth of field or a little? Sixteen. It'd, it'd be more. It'd be more at sixteen than four, so it, it might be eleven, might be eight. You know, I mean, there's not a, you know, a little bit soft in the background, so, so. Uh, you have to choose any special lenses for this because you are using a, a slow shutter speed. And so the question is, are you, am I using any special lenses because I'm using a slow shutter speed? Absolutely not. Every lens does this. Same thing. You can you can stop it down and, and let very little light in, or you can open it up as big as the opening is. Now, almost all cameras, the the minimum f stop is 22 or 32, or almost all lenses, not cameras, it's the lens, 22 or 32. The other end varies greatly. Some lenses, uh, 5.6 is the the biggest opening. Uh, some it's 3.5. Some it's 2.8. Uh, you, you know, some with 1.8, 1.4. So if you need to shoot in low light situations, you get a 1.4 lens. So you let the most light in possible. Okay. But that's on the extreme side. My fastest lenses are 2.8. All my all my lenses except one or two are 2.8. Um, and and including my zooms, they're, they're a constant 2.8 throughout. And I'd spend a lot more money to get that, but the quality is better. So that's, that's what it's important to me. So a uh, question was about file types. Um, so your camera will shoot two different types of files. One's called a JPEG and one's called RAW, R-A-W. JPEG is a compression file format. So it, it, the camera uh, creates the file and then it compresses it to make it smaller. So a JPEG file is a lot smaller than a RAW file. But in order to compress it, it has to throw away information, right? So in your camera, you can set how, uh, what level of compression you want for your JPEGs. All cameras will let you select the, your quality. So they might call it quality and they might call it size, but it, what it's doing is how much compression is happening. Raw files are un uncompressed and, and the camera isn't doing anything to them, um, which gives you the highest quality possible. And raw files let you do more to them in the computer than you can with a JPEG. Uh, I shoot only raw and, and most uh, serious photographers shoot raw. Uh, some cameras you can shoot raw and JPEG. Now, the bad part about raw files is you can't email a raw file to somebody else to look at unless they have software to open it up and look at it. You can't put a raw file. Can't hear. Lauren can't hear. Yeah, sound is out. Okay, are you hearing me now? Yes. 
Okay, sorry, don't know what happened there. It probably doesn't sound as good, but um, so uh, wh where did I go out? Uh, the, the difference between RAW and JPEG, um, RAW files, uh, you can't email to someone. You have to convert it to a JPEG to email it to them. You can't put a RAW file on a web page or Instagram or something like that. You have to make a JPEG to do that. So, uh, so there's a trade-off there, but the quality trade-off is, is massive. Now, you remember back when we talked about the little icons on your exposure, what that's doing to your camera, or what that's doing to your files. And that is really only doing something to your, that is actually doing something to your JPEG files. So your JPEGs will, will uh, your camera will add saturation to the colors, it will add sharpening to the picture, it will add uh, contrast, uh, it, it manipulates the photos. So your JPEGs will, if you open a JPEG and you open a RAW picture beside it, your JPEG usually looks better than the RAW because it's had all this post-processing done in the camera. Now, if you like the way that's looking, that's good. If you don't like the way that's looking, that's not good. So you need to uh, think about whether you want to shoot RAW or JPEG. Now, RAW files take up, you know, massive amount more space on your computer than than JPEG. So, so there's the trade-off of that. Do you have to use something like Photoshop in order to um, to convert those RAW files to JPEG? Uh, no, you don't have to use every every camera comes with some software. Uh, uh, that will do that. So Nikon's, Nikon has a, a camera raw uh, Canon. Everybody ha includes a way to do that. Uh, they don't all have a lot of control. Uh, they don't have as many controls as using Photoshop or a program like Lightroom, uh, which it, Lightroom has really become the standard for, for uh, using, uh, for both organizing and toning photos until you have extreme things you need to do in, in Photoshop. So I'm at the point where about 90% of my photos I only touch in Lightroom. About 10% I take to Photoshop and and do some uh, additional work on them. But but every photo I shoot or display, I have to do something to in Lightroom to to get the most out of it. Lauren, my yes. can shoot. I can shoot both at the same time. Do yes. You, do I lose anything in the raw because of that? No, you don't lose anything in the raw, but you're 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 taking up a lot more space on your memory card right. and your computer. Now, okay. some cameras have two memory cards and you can shoot raw to one and JPEG to the other. Uh, that can get a little confusing in my world, but, but no, you're not hurting the raws at all by making a JPEG also. Thank you. Uh, Thank the you. only thing that will happen is it will take your, you can't, you can't do a burst. You can't hold down the shutter button and fire off 30 in a row if you're doing that because it just takes more time to write to the card. So it'll, so your, uh, your your buffer will fill up faster, but that's only if you're blasting away. If you're just shooting normal, it's, it's not a problem at all. So, so what's the advantage of, of, of both, of using both? What's the, advantage, uh, the advantage of shooting both is uh, if, you, if you're shooting RAW and JPEG at the same time, you have the RAW files immediately to share with someone. And then you have the JPEG to get the highest quality, or you have the, what did I just say? Yeah. You, I just said it wrong. Scratch that. You have the JPEG to send to somebody immediately. Okay. You don't have to do anything to that file. You can, if you have a, a, a Wi-Fi built in your camera, you can send it right there. And then you also have the raw file to get the highest quality if you want to process it later, if you're going to make a print or, or do something and you want to make it look better than the JPEG. So, so if I'm importing all of my, if I'm importing all of my pictures straight to Lightroom, JPEG is not necessary I, because I can, I can change, I, I can export it as a JPEG. Then, right? So if you're using Lightroom, when you do an import, it's really only importing the raw files. Right. So the JPEG. And so then when you export out of Lightroom, you export as a JPEG. Right. Yes. It does keep track of the JPEGs for you, but what you're seeing uh, will be the raw files in Lightroom. You won't see two copies of your photos. But you said it, it keeps track of the JPEG? Yes, 
If you tell it you want to see the JPEG, it'll let you. Let's say an example of something that you can do with a raw photo that you couldn't do with a JPEG photo. So the question is, what, what's an example of something you can do with a raw photo you can't do with a JPEG? Um, so if you, um, so there's, there's the, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, white balance or color balance. So you have a setting on your camera uh, for different light sources. So daylight, which my lights in my office here are all daylight balanced. Uh, are, is considered white light. So sunlight at noon is considered white light. Uh, a tungsten light bulb, a regular old fashioned light bulb is yellow compared to daylight, um, which is why at blue hour you're seeing yellow lights in the houses. Uh, uh, fluorescent light is green compared to daylight. Uh, mercury vapor is well, who knows what, just wacky orange crap. Um, so when you're shooting uh, JPEGs, you need to tell your camera what light temperature, it's actually temperature, what light source, what color balance the light is, and so it will match that. Now, most cameras have an auto white balance, and, and it's called AWB, auto white balance, and it comes, does a really good job of color correcting whatever light source you're using. So uh, that is the only thing I shoot automatic in my camera is auto white balance. Um, but I also adjust that in Lightroom on my raw files. So if you shoot a JPEG, if you're shooting JPEG and you have your uh, white balance set to daylight and you take a picture of somebody with tungsten light bulbs, regular light bulbs, they're gonna come out this yellow orange that is horrendous. And you will have a, just a terrible time cleaning that up out of a JPEG. If you shot it raw, two seconds you clean it up and, it, and it's, it's gone. So um, that's, that's the, the biggie is, is color balance with JPEGs and RAW. Uh, there are a lot of other, you, you, can, you can make greater adjustments to the RAW file than you can a JPEG. So if you wanna make your blues bluer or, or you know, whatever you're trying to do, you have much, much more control over a RAW file than a JPEG. And, and no, no uh, information was tossed away because that's how they make, make the file smaller is, is uh, and so, so the way, way the compression works, actually, it's kind of cool, is if there's a, say there's a, a, a space in, say your picture's this wide and uh, this much, it's black. So uh, compression says, okay, from here to here is black, so I don't need to know any of that information in the middle, just remembers that from there is, there is black and then from here to here is red, so I'll just throw all that away. And, and so it, it literally goes through line by line of your photo and says, well, how far away is something? And so the greater the compression, the, the, uh, the less uh, sensitive to the tones it becomes. So if you compress it you know, extremely, you'll end up with a picture with eight tones in it. You know, it'll look just horrible, horrible. But if you give it a, you know, very, very little compression, it's a very gradual. And uh, if you if you open a JPEG file and make some changes to it and save it, you're recompressing it again. If you open it again, you recompress it and you recompress and you recompress every time you open and save it. So uh, you you are degrading it every time you open and save. So that's why raw raw works more better, as I like to say. But I always make people cringe when I say more better. I'm still trying to figure out why why, why I can say less better. It's less better, but I can't say it's more better. A little less better. Anyway, other questions? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so if you're trying to get a JPEG that, to look pretty much like the original RAW, is that possible? If you're trying to get a JPEG to look like an original RAW, Sorry, it no, no. maybe. It's a maybe, but it could be a big maybe not. Um, you know, how would you know if you could or not? How would, would you, it be based you just on have to try the it. environment? Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's based, I mean, it's, uh, so a, a raw, raw file, a, a, an unprocessed raw file will actually look much worse than, an, than a JPEG. Um, and 
that's just because it didn't have anything happen to it in the camera. Like I said, the JPEG is getting, it's getting some contrast added to it. It's getting saturation added to it. It's getting sharpening added to it. And so when you look at the picture, you go, wow, that looks a lot better. And in fact, when you're chimping, you're looking at the JPEG that even if you're shooting raw, it creates a little JPEG that you can't see. And that's what you see on their screen on your camera. So if you pull, if you pull, if you shoot raw and you open them up in Lightroom, you go, wow, those don't look nearly as good as it did when I was chimping my camera. And, and what's the deal? Well, you're seeing the raw that doesn't have anything happening to it. So usually the case is the raw looks worse or not as great as a JPEG until you, if you enlarge it, then you'll see, see a lot of difference. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're trying to, you know, if, if you shoot in the wrong color balance, the wrong light, you know, your raw file, is going to look so much better than that JPEG and you're going to have a really, really tough time getting that JPEG coming back down to where it should be. So, I mean, okay. what, you know, I, I shoot nature-based and, and I process and I shoot my pictures in such a way that it, it is a true representation of what I'm seeing. Now, what I see and what the camera sees is a different thing, but I process my pictures so when you look at them, you don't go, Wow, he ran that through Photoshop, didn't he? <laughs> when that happens, I've failed. That's a big fail for me. Now, some people, that's fine. You know, it depends what you're doing and what kind of photography you're doing. If you, you know, you, you know, some people love to have the filters on them and, and make them look funky and wacky, and, and that's perfectly, you know, perfectly fine. But that's not my style, and that's not what I'm trying to achieve. So, I I am always toning my photos to bring out the most of, of what is there. But, them garish and not make them oversaturated and like how can that be you know you look at this photo up there you don't go how can that be other than the, the obvious distortion i did with uh, shutter speed but you know it's not going to be i don't 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 ever say you photoshop that yeah go away <laughs> okay so Here's what the camera controls, depth of field, shutter speed. Everything else is up to you. What's, what's, uh, what's really important is what you point the camera at when and at one angle. That's what photography is really about, the create, creative part of photography. It's not technical. Technical is really pretty easy. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a three quick decisions, right? What's my ISO going to be? Well, I know. I, you know, I'm going to Iceland on Thursday. My ISO is set at 100. When I get back from, IS, from Iceland, it's still going to be at 100. It will not come off of 100 that whole time, I guarantee you. So I, you know, I've eliminated one of the things I'm going to think about while I'm there. You know, the other technical thing is going to be, do I want a lot of shutter speed, a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed? Every time I shoot a picture, that's going to be a decision. Every time I shoot a picture, it's going to be, do I want a lot of depth of field or a little? That's all the camera does. That's all the camera does. Everything else, you know, there's a computer built into your camera that does all kinds of wacky things. They put 800 menus in there to make you think you're getting a great deal when you're buying their camera. But all the camera does is the same thing as my ancient 100-year-old box camera sitting right there. Shutter speed and aperture. But what, what makes a picture better is where you're pointing it, what you're taking a picture of, when and what angle and how you post-process it. And that's, that's the sad reality of, of our cameras now, is we've got these cameras with just a billion things in the menus. And I can tell you- I have you, a kind of quick- Yeah? I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I got a random question. So I, uh, I don't have a digital camera anymore. I have a, a old uh, Pentax. Uh, SLR. Um, do you still shoot with any uh, SLRs? No, I don't. Um, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious. That's my grandfather, and so it's it's a lot it's a lot of sentimental reasons that I'm I'm using it. But I I uh, I have a lot to learn on them. <laughs> well, you but you don't. You have two things to learn. You know what what film speed you want. So the, the bad thing about film is once you put a roll of film in the camera, 
you have 36 shots that are going to be the exact same on your on your films on your ISO. You can't change that once you start shooting that way. So you have to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. But then it's, the only thing that camera is going to do is depth of field and shutter speed. You know, that's the great thing. That's all it is. That's all any camera is. You know, they've added autofocus, which is a beautiful thing. You know, that that's a great assist to help you focus. Uh, you know, but everything else in that camera is just junk. You know, it's just junk. So as you're learning, ignore all that junk. You know, go to aperture priority. And, and as you're doing aperture priority, you can control your shutter speed. Because if you have a, a small opening, you're going to have a slower shutter speed than you do if you have a big opening. Right? So if I come up to a waterfalls and I say, oh, I like that moving water. I want to have a slow shutter speed. I'm in aperture priority. I'm going to go for the smallest aperture I can so I get the longest shutter speed possible. If I want to have the fastest shutter speed possible, I use the biggest opening there is. Technically, that's all the camera can do. Everything else becomes the creative, creative thing. So, Lauren, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so if you're shooting a picture in low light photography, uh, in the low light, yes. and is your recommendation still to take the picture at ISO 100 and use the post-processing software to brighten up the image if I needed to? No. No. If you're shooting low light, increase your ISO. Uh, um, because if, if, you, if you underexpose your shots, if they come out dark and you try to, you know, sometimes you can pull it out in post-processing, but you're going to add a lot of noise to the picture and the quality is gonna, going to uh, go down. So you, you really want to nail your exposure as close as you can to start with. If it's, you know, a really black photo and really dark, you're not going to pull it out. You know, you can do a lot more now than you used to be able to. but but uh, you, you, the, you know, the, the better your image to start with, the better it's going to end up on the end. Um, so the one thing we talked about early on was if you are taking a picture of a black cat and it comes out gray, what do you do? So on all your cameras, digital, not, not our film friend here, uh, film, you, you have to hit your exposure. Um, you have what's called exposure compensation. And every camera, that's different. So I can't tell you where it's at, but look it up. And with exposure compensation, you can still shoot in aperture priority, but you can increase the exposure by one or two or three, or some of them go up five stops. And so uh, generally, if you're shooting on the beach or in snow, and they're coming out gray, you need to increase your exposure, which sounds exactly opposite of what it should be, but you need to increase your exposure from what the camera is telling you by using exposure compensation, and it's probably two full stops. So your camera will have a little little bar on the back, uh, a little, little uh, chart, not a chart, it's a graph, that's the word I'm looking for, and it has a zero. And then on one side of it says plus one, or maybe just one, two, and three. On the other side, it's minus one, minus two, minus three, some of them will do five, but most of them are one, two, or three, plus or minus. And so that's your exposure compensation. And so you need to look up how you change your exposure compensation. So when you get, you know, when you chimp your photo and it's too dark or too bright, then you shoot another one by, cha you know, you change your exposure compensation. And if you're shooting an aperture priority, that's going to change your shutter speed. If you're changing, if you're in shutter priority, that's going to change your aperture because you're setting the, you know, an aperture, an aperture priority. Priority. you're setting the aperture, it's changing the shutter speed. So when, when the exposure isn't right, you got to get in there to exposure compensation and, and make that change. Okay. I'd love Thank to be you. able to show you how to do that on your cameras, but every one of them is different, including different models of the same brand, which drives me nuts. Okay. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, so 
so I think you probably shot a lot of film as well. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about the comparison between shooting with film and what you could do there and what you have done with digital? Digital absolutely blows it away. Um, I started shooting digital in about uh, 2000, year 2000. Um, and at that point, uh, uh, I was working at a newspaper and the digital camera was uh, $12,000. And they had, they were, what were they? Uh, three megapixels, right? And the quality was horrible. But when you work in, you know, the great thing and bad thing about working in a newspaper, you're printing on newsprint, which is next thing to toilet paper and the quality of paper in the world. So picture, you know, picture never looks good on newsprint. So you can shoot with a crappy digital camera and, you know, they save tons of money on film. Um, but now it's at the point where uh, I just do things with film, with digital that I can't even imagine trying to do on film. And you can't like uh, astrophotography, taking pictures of the Milky Way. You know, you just can't do that with film. You know, there's special ways you, they, the, you had to buy special film that had been uh, specially gassed to increase the, the ISO of the film. And it was incredibly expensive. And, you know, you're out there shooting in the dark and you're literally shooting in the dark because you had no idea if it was going to be any good. You spent a lot of money on that film and the processing and you know, didn't know till a week later where they got it. But now I can be out there in the middle of the night shooting away, chimping away and going, woo! Just look at that, you know. How long does it take to uh, what kind of shutter speed do you use for that? So, what kind of shutter speed do you use for astrophotography? Uh, 30 seconds, uh, and it depends on what lens you're using. The wider, the wider, yes, you want to be as wide as possible. The wider you get, the longer your shutter speed can be before your stars start to blur because of motion. So, uh, there's an app for that, but but uh. Generally, with a with a, about a 15 millimeter lens, you can do 30 seconds, and it varies from camera to camera and lens to lens. But but as you get if you get any longer than that, you get motion in the in the stars. And I'm sure you use a tripod for that. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have to use a tripod for that. There's just yeah. that's not even a. So let me one thing about tripods. Um, a lot of people will go out and buy a, a cheap, flimsy tripod, thinking I'm just getting started. Don't. You're, you know, if it, if it costs $75, you're wasting $75 because it'll be cheap and flimsy and light and, and you, you think you're getting solid pictures, but you're not. And then when you bring them into Lightroom or whatever, they're going to be, you're going to be disappointed. So if you don't have a tripod, don't spend $75 on a tripod. Wait until you can spend at least $250 and get a solid tripod. And don't get one where the leg, the, the little leg is the size of your finger, your pinky because that's gonna be a shaky tripod. So save up your money and get a good one. And if you get a good one and spend 250 or more, uh, it'll last you the rest of your life. So, you know, you're not buying little $75 ones because they break and, and your pictures are bad. And where do, you, where do you buy your equipment? Where do I buy my equipment? Um, uh, a lot at B&H, uh, camera, photo and video. It's bnhphotovideo.com, uh, which is the world's largest photo store in New York. And it's, uh, I mean, it's an amazing place. Uh, and they have great prices and pretty good customer service. Uh, I like, you know, I, I like dealing with little guys. Uh, the last camera I bought from a little camera store in Pennsylvania because I could, it was, it was uh, uh, a new model came out and I could get one from them before I could get one from B&H because my pro rep helped me get one there. But, you know, I like to buy from the little guys. And, and a lot of the little guys, uh, Alan's camera over in, Pennsylvania. What, what town is that? Anyway, Alan's camera is a great place, and and he'll give you the same price as B and H. Um, but uh, B and H is, I mean, they're just killer. I mean, you know, if you haven't been to their superstore in Manhattan, it's, you know, don't walk in there with a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> if, you know, unless you have a lot of self control. If you have no self control, do not walk in there with a credit card. It's, it's disgusting. <laughs> That's how I don't want to go in the yarn shop. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is uh, three stories of, anyway, it's massive. Other questions or thoughts? Thank you.
Yeah, I think it was really nice of you to hold this workshop. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. It's You're very helpful. Yeah. yeah, super helpful. Great. So if you have any questions at any point, drop me an email, uh, and I'll I'll answer answer what I know, and I'll make up what I don't know. So, uh, but uh, you know, the the real the real key to to learning photography is taking pictures, and so I always suggest to people practice. You know, practice. If you've ever learned a musical instrument or played in a sport, you didn't just start playing games or start playing songs. You had to play scales on the piano that were just repetitive and boring. And you know, it's, and the same way with photography, you need to practice. And so if you just spend five minutes, three times a week, taking some pictures of just you know, whatever, the, your window, and try some with a fast shutter speed, some with a slow, some with a, a lot of depth of field, some with a little, in no time you're gonna, you're gonna feel really comfortable with that camera. And that's all it takes, you know, if you, if you only shoot once a month, once every other month, you're never gonna feel comfortable with that camera. But, you know, you don't have to spend hours, you know, don't have to, oh, I have to shoot. Well, that's okay, just take a picture of a flower pot or, or you know, plate sitting on a table. Try it with a lot of depth of field, try it with a little, you know. Cars driving by the street in front of you. Fast shutter speed, slow shutter speed. You throw the pictures away, but you learn. Yeah, you know, the one thing I say about digital is film's cheap, you know, just, uh, so so the question is on my chart uh somebody's somebody's making a somebody's got a lot of noise going there online if you, you know, that'd be great if if uh so if you wanted 5.6 and and your shutter speed is one one thousandth that is true at iso 100 at uh, on a bright sunny day okay. any other situation if it's not a bright sunny day those do not match up like that so how do i determine that relation so how do you know that well the easiest way is put it on aperture priority and then decide do i want a lot of depth of field or little and it's going to figure out it's going to compute your shutter speed for you if you're shooting in manual exposure mode there's a little meter showing inside your viewfinder when you look through the camera or if you're doing live preview on the back that is the scale that looks the same as the exposure compensation. And so you want to usually zero, you, you want your, your meter showing right in the middle at that zero point, unless you want to underexpose, then you do go to the minus. If you want it brighter, overexposed, you go to the plus. But starting out, you know, start out on aperture priority because manual, you have to think way too much. And you get confused and mad and don't want to do it again. Or at least I did. Thank you. I'm currently reading a book by Art. This is Janice. Yes. I'm reading a book um, by Art Wolf, as yeah. in the fox. I, I think he's given me great ideas that um, I will definitely be getting out there more frequently and taking, you know, hopefully on a positively side to take better pictures yeah art, art is a great photographer he's one of the greats but you know don't don't think that you have to go out and shoot something great to learn you know shooting shooting your cat walking around in a room and making mistakes you're going to learn a lot more from your mistakes than you do from your the things you hit it right so don't you know don't wait you know i, I don't have you know i don't have four hours i don't have the day to go shoot and i don't i don't know where to go take pictures Mm -hmm. doesn't matter you know as you're learning it doesn't matter it's it's an exercise it's a training exercise so shoot anything and throw them away or keep them doesn't matter but you know the, the key is putting your hands on that camera at least every week and trying something and then you're going to feel more confident much much faster when, when you take your picture is there information that tells you what aperture and what speed and everything you use, you got to like remember that. Okay, great question. So uh, the question is, does 
do you have to remember what aperture and shutter speed you use? No, in a digital camera, it's all recorded. So uh, uh, the software that comes with the camera will show you your aperture, your, your, your shutter speed, uh, your ISO. It'll show you what lens you use. It'll tell you the camera. It'll tell you the time of day. Uh, down to the second. Uh, give you full information. Done. Show that in Photoshop. So Photoshop will show that. Lightroom will show that. Uh, the camera raw, whatever comes, you know, the Nikon software, the Canon software, whatever software. Um, if you're using uh, Mac, uh, uh, the pre the free preview program will show that on Windows. Uh, Windows Picture, what the hell they call it? Properties. Properties, yeah. So it, it's real easy to find. It's called metadata. So you're looking for that metadata. Um, and if you want to know what other people are shooting, go on Flickr, flickr.com, and, and people post their pictures there, and they post the metadata. So you can, you know, you, you don't have to use my theory of I can tell what it is by looking at it. You know, you can go on there and, and look at pictures and say, oh, okay, and then I'll try to guess. Then you can look at the metadata that they post, and it'll tell you exactly what settings they use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This, this meetup has other, other meetups. Yes, right? yes. So the question is about meetups. So I have a lot of other workshops I do that I post on meetup and, and also on my website okay. uh, at laurenphotos.com. Some are local and some are travel and, and uh, some are free and some are not. Okay. Uh, I make my living, so mm -hmm. everything's not free in life, unfortunately. But, okay. But, uh, any other questions? Uh, how about the focal length? How focal length affects uh, the depth of the field and uh, the lens focal length? So how does lens focal length affect depth of field? The, the more telephoto you have, the less depth of field you have. The wider angle you have, the more depth of field you have. So that's another thing you can play with. You know, just take a, take a picture of a, you know, I have a, a teddy bear. Although his name's Ted because he doesn't, he's grown up. He doesn't want to be called Teddy. Uh, and I take a, you know, I'll just set him up and, and, you know, a stuffed animal, set it up and, and take a picture of it with the wide angle and have it, you know, fill up the picture, then move back and shoot it with the telephoto and have it fill up the picture and look at the two. And you'll see amazing difference in how that photo looks, the relationship to background and depth of field and all kinds of things happen really crazy. So, you noticed a lot of my pictures are shot with an extreme wide angle and you it's harder to tell but i shoot a lot with an extreme telephoto too uh, i shoot a lot at 16 millimeters or 14 millimeters and i shoot a lot at at 400 or 600 or 800 millimeters because there's a, a an um the 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 lens has an amazing effect on how the picture looks which is way too much to talk about tonight Right. <laughs> that's, your other that's that, that I go into in, in more advanced workshops. Yes. Okay. Hope cool. to see you. Yeah, I'd like to take better vacation photos. Yeah. Me too. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I will post this online, and it, uh, uh, the the link will be on my website, so you can see the the link on the website. So the recording of this will be available. Uh, Probably starting late tomorrow afternoon. It takes a while to get it all posted, but but you can find the link to the recording on my website. Okay, great. great. Thank, Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Have a good trip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A good trip to Iceland. Thank you.